Um, I would like, this is a great pleasure for me to introduce Mechthild Wurdorfer, who is now at the IEA, um, the International Energy Agency. Um, and uh, she is a great leader in this space with great vision. Um, and I will let you tell your story. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shali, and thank you very much uh, for the organizers uh, to have me speak this afternoon. I have some slides. So, my name is Mechthild Wurstorfer. I work in the IEA, International Energy a Agency, here in Paris. The International Energy Agency uh, has been created 40, 45 years ago and uh, follows all kind of energy-related subjects going from energy security to clean energy transitions. And ha it has about 30 members, but we are also reaching out to China, India, Brazil, Mexico. So we are kind of global energy institution. And my role there is to look after technologies, sustainability, and our outlooks, our scenario uh, work here uh, at IEA and in Paris. So I'm very particularly pleased uh, uh, happy to be here. Before that, I worked for many, many years in Brussels at the European Commission. So some of the things I hear here uh, are also very much known and very interesting for me. So I would like to set a little bit the scene from an energy perspective. So if we look at where we are in terms of energy demand worldwide, these are the figures from the last couple of years. And if you look at our figure from 2018, you can see energy demand grew by 2.3% uh, compared to the previous year, which means in terms of the different resources worldwide, an increase in renewables, but also in gas, oil, coal, and nuclear. And this is obviously very much depends on the regions on where we are. Coal, for example, uh, in Europe and US, it's basically a phase out over time, but there are still new coal power plant uh, built, for example, in China and India. So this is some of the issues. And then we have renewables increase, nuclear, where the country, uh, it's always an issue, but certainly where uh, the country wants to go for nuclear, and oil is still pretty much present and dominant in the transport sector. With this, you can see that also the energy-related CO2 emissions hit a record, a record high last year. So we had a couple of years, 2014, 15, 16, relatively stable CO2 emissions worldwide. We already saw an increase in 2017, but again, last year, 2018, it was an increase of the global CO2 emissions by 1.7%, so a record high of em uh, emissions worldwide. And this, despite impacts and positive impacts of energy efficiency, increase in low carbon resources, it's still driven to, by the fossil fuels, and in particularly coal, but also weather conditions, cooling, uh, and other factors which made this uh, high emissions. On the other side, the International Energy Agency is doing always different scenarios. So this, what I present here, is a comparison which what we call or called new policy scenario and what we call sustainable development scenario. So the new policy scenario would be with our known uh, policies which we have already put in place or at least stated, uh, so there are measures already introduced, we would really go in, in terms of CO2 emissions to a slight increase and not at all compliant with the Paris Agreement. We always do, since two, three years, what we call a sustainable development scenario, which means that we are well below two degrees. It's compatible with Paris Agreement. It includes not only climate change, but also data on bringing access to energy to everyone 
and reducing air pollution. So the sustainable development goals, certainly uh, related to energy, are incorporated in this scenario. If you look what needs to be done to go from the policy as usual, to go in a way down with the emissions to be Paris compatible, the major, major um, first fuel is certainly energy efficiency. The next one is going to more renewables. And then we have a full range of things we need to do depending a little bit on the circumstances, on the regions, and on the sectors. So it's clear that with fuel switching, for example, coal to gas, or gas to renewables, we can save um, emissions. Nuclear is a low carbon uh, resource. We have other technologies, known technologies, like carbon capture and utilization and storage, which is CCUS certainly in those sectors where we cannot electrify or where it's hard to abate sectors and some industry sectors. And there are a couple of others, hydrogen uh, in some areas um, or other technologies. So we need certainly to prioritize all measures around energy efficiency and renewables, but there are a few sectors, a few areas where we also need other technologies to all, in order to come up with this sustainable development scenario. By the way, we are updating this right now, and our World Energy Outlook comes out next week, 13th of November, here in Paris, and then we will present it in other um, capitals, which has, I would say, similar messages, but obviously updated information on where to go to be Paris compliant, including uh, a chapter on 1.5. Uh, which is uh, in, in, in our world energy outlook. So what does it mean for the energy sector and digitalization? We did a major report on digitalization in the energy sector, it's a year and a half ago, and we are now updating and looking in specific sector more deeply. So we are obviously convinced that all the digital technology can help improve safety, productivity, and efficiency of energy systems, and that in different sectors like transport and mobility, e-mobility, and automated uh, driving, like in buildings, like in industry, but also through all, all that uh, energy system in power, in oil and gas, and in coal. So we certainly see a strong, strong role to combine digital and the energy sector. And in my previous job, we started already uh, inviting energy and IT companies to work together on IoT, on blo uh, blockchain, on other instruments. And it's clear there's still a way to go to bring, so that's why also this event today is certainly contributing to make that happen in the energy sector. Let me give you some examples from that study um, in, in my presentation. So we are, in the energy sector, have had a pre-digital energy system, which was pretty, pretty easy energy produced, and it was one directional flows in the different areas, being um, to the uh, buildings uh, or from, to industry or to other um, needs where energy was needed from the production side. And obviously, transmission and distribution of that energy, like RTE and other, had a big role to play there. This is changing. And if we look at the flows going from one place to the other, they are not any more um, only unidirectional, but they will change into multidirectional and in a highly integrated energy system. And that we see in Europe, we see in US, we see in other places, also Southeast Asia, where more and more interconnectivity and this multidirectional flows are happening and still need to be increased to be efficient. One big area in, in, in the energy side, because for many years we focused a lot on the supply side. We start to know a little bit more about the demand side and demand response, where we still need to look a bit deeper in order to get all the details, all the facts, all the 
uh, economies and scaling what we can do in the different end use sectors like buildings, industry and transport. But in our study, which we did, we thought it could be provide 185 gigawatts of flexibility and it would avoid globally 270 billion of investments in new electricity infrastructure. If we look at the households and the smart appliances, which could participate but are not yet participating in the interconnected electricity systems. We already, you mentioned it, the big role of mobility and uh, the use of electric vehicles, which is still a rather small part of the car fleet. But last year we had 5 million electric cars, increased by 2 billion from the year before. So there is a, 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 an increase, a quite uh, interesting increase, certainly in China and some parts of Europe and in the US, um, parts of the US, where this is important. With the electric vehicles, obviously, we need to fix the charging um, and the, the charging station, which could provide further flexibility to the grid and could also provide savings between 100 and 280 US billion US dollars investment in new electricity infrastructure. But we had also a deep dive in the EU. This is the small chart on the right side, where we have EV standard versus smart charging. So we need certainly to upscale um, the, the charging requirements if we go for more electric vehicles and here digitalization and all the new uh, possibilities could certainly diminish uh, the time and also to, to increase the rollout of electric vehicles and charging stations. We also know if we go and we go for more renewables, solar and wind are variable, so they are not available all the time. So we have more solar and wind, more variable renewables, which we need to integrate in the system. This is the flexibility challenge we have. We had been discussing that in different places. So digitalization, we see a big role here to also see the integration of variable renewables by enabling the grids to better match the energy demand to times when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. So digitalization here to optimize the use of variable renewables and here again the transmission system operators uh, and the DSO can play a role uh, in order to get um, the optimal um, flexibility and integration of solar PV and wind in the grids. We have come out, I think, last week with our latest renewables report, which is a focus on distributed energy resources, which is something not only in the homes, as the picture shows, solar PV, distributed PV is increasing, but also in industry. Here again, digitalization can facilitate the deployment of residential solar PV and storage, making it easier to store and sell surplus electricity to the grid or locally uh, with the help of digital digitalization. One other element, as I mentioned before, it's the integration, it's the renewables, it's the grids, but also energy efficiency. And today, we came out with our energy efficiency report which shows that overall, unfortunately, efforts on energy efficiency are slowing down. We have seen that already in previous years. We have an energy efficiency rate of 1.2% every year in the, in the last report in last year. In order to be Paris compliant, we would need 3% globally. There are some parts where it's happening, but not here in Europe, for example, or in other parts. So we have a challenge of increasing, having more energy efficiency across the sector, and here certainly digitalization, and that's one focus of the report which came out today, uh, the role of digitalization in energy efficiency. So it could help to accurately measure the energy savings and understand exactly where and when efficiency is delivered. So with that tools, we could be much more targeted 
and uh, efficient in the rollout of, for example, demand-side integration measures with energy efficiency, electrification, load shifting and load shedding as shown in that slide. A last word when we speak about the electricity sector in particular, but in general digitalization and energy. We are looking right now um, a bit deeper again on the electricity security side, which is particularly important uh, to avoid blackouts, to avoid um, anything uh, which is climate related. But one chapter will also be dedicated to cyber secu security in a digital power system. If we are more and more dependent on digitalization and di smart grids and smart homes and smart appliances and a digitally integrated system, we need also to look at cyber security. And this is an area where we haven't done a lot right now. But in that report, in the electricity security report, which will only come out mid next year, we are looking at best practices, at regulations which are working, at platforms which are working, in order to exchange at the first stage um, good practices which go hand in hand with cybersecurity to maintain the system reliability. So this is one of our focus in that debate. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Would, would, would you like, do you want to take any questions? I can take one or two, yeah. Yeah, how, how about, because uh, Mathilde's not going to be with us for all that long. Um, do, does anybody have any questions? In a Thank you. sleepy late afternoon. Okay, Donnie's. <laughs> Right. That's okay. okay. It's okay. <laughs> so I'm obviously not an operator or in any way involved in creating this whole thing other than helping you understand open source. But I am a person who also lives part time in California. And, um, you know, we're suddenly on the edge of climate change in a way that's pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> so my question is do you feel like there's hope? I've been working 10, 12 years now in the energy and climate change policy areas. I'm an optimist by nature. So I would say, yes, there's obviously hope, but there is unfortunately the reality, which is, as I showed in the beginning, which is shocking. So we had Paris, here in Paris, the COP21, the agreement, which was a major uh, step forward uh, with 180 signatories in 2015, which announced a peak in emission as soon as possible. Four years later, or three years, but this year's figures will, won't be much better, we see a peak in CO2 emissions. So the urgency is certainly there. As I say, there are measures in energy efficiency, but not enough. There is an energy transition in California, in many areas, but also in other parts of Europe, in, in Asia part, partly, uh, the, that we are going to a low carbon energy transition, but not fast enough. I think the big message is the urgency and why uh, I think uh, the future, uh, Friday for Future and the youth movement is extremely important, but also the role of governments. When we come out next week with the World Energy Outlook, everything industry is doing, what we can do as consumers, or what organizations can do is extremely helpful. But the role of governments to set the right policy framework and regulatory framework is hugely important, certainly for energy efficiency. When we look at, for example, the EU, they have provided a framework for 2030 for energy and climate policy with targets for minus 40%, which will be revised upwards, uh, reduction of CO2 emissions, 32% of energy efficiency, 32% of renewables by 2030. Europe is not yet there, but at least they have created a framework and measures to achieve that. There are other examples, but I think the, the sense of urgency and that we all need to move together, not only in the power sector, which is normally the one which is the most advanced when it comes to uh, cleaner or carbon-free 
low carbon transitions. It's the transport sector, which is still two thirds dominated by oil. It's the building sector and it's partly industry. So I think if we achieve more electrification, more low carbon industry, uh, low carbon transformation in all these sectors, then obviously we could be optimistic by 2050 to come. Uh, but we need to start now. I mean, by 2050 means that we need to start now. As you know, energy investments are, are long time investments. So if we don't do it now, we, we never achieve it. So this me message of urgency, what the agency does is providing data and scenarios. But the, the, uh, the action and advising governments, but the action and the regulatory framework should come from the governments. Um, and I think all our um, pressure and our actions to help that happen is needed nowadays. Thank you. One more, or we, we're good? One more. Dan Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on the energy efficiency side, if you look at the report, which is online, free, free downloading of today, um, it was um, put on the web this morning, you will find a huge chapter on digitalization and use of open source is mentioned there for the energy efficiency and end use sectors. So if you look then at industry buildings and best practice, there is uh, different ways but open source is one way and it's mentioned there in, in the context. And quite some good example, what we are also admitting in that report, there's still some uncertainty about the impact if you want to quantify it. But there is a first step and a first analytical piece we did on energy efficiency, open source and digitalization in total. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say that one of the hardest things for me um, has been trying to figure out how to build community around the behind the meter because mm -hmm. the fragmentation is just enormous. I mean, you know, Harry knows we, we've had a working group that's been meeting for about six months, um, both within Europe and, and in the United States. And um, so I really look forward to working with IEA. Kathleen and I had a conversation yeah. about it yesterday. Um, because uh, I think that we need your help to be able to, uh, you know, many of the appliance manufacturers, electronics manufacturers are all members of the Linux Foundation. Okay. So when I kind of imagine about how to leverage sort of the Linux Foundation towards being able to build those kinds of agreements, um, I think it really requires a broker like IEA um, and the research that you've done that really mm. pinpoints things. Um, but it's quite fragmented, and I think that part of what makes you know, working with yeah. the transmission system easier is because there's only 263 in the world, and then, you know, and then at the DSO level, there's a lot more. Um, but then you get to the behind the meter and uh, the ability to really enable demand flexibility at scale, it's, it's, it's huge, so. No, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, on the energy efficiency side, demand side responsibility, there are many, many actors which makes it difficult with all the goodwill to progress. So you, bringing them together is certainly something which is absolutely needed. That's why we are happy to contribute as much as we can. Um, and I think you're coming to the IA I this am. week, so you will yeah. meet a couple of other colleagues there. So, um, but digitalization in that sense can obviously, that's the platform, that's the idea, because we were struggling since 10 years on the energy efficiency front, even more than on other, uh, on other areas of the energy policy, because there are a lot of small scale projects, a lot of players to be put together um, to make that happen. Uh, so I think your, your initiative here, your platform here is very much welcome. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's See a you around. Thank you. See you on Thursday. Yeah.